Once you get involved in the actual situation, it was just so hard to keep a cool head, to know who the hell you are. Facing the thousands of people who cheered me on, I was completely carried away. Now here I was, speaking at Tiananmen Square, I felt that my words could sway the fate of the nation. After people prevented the army convoys from entering the city, there was a stalemate. During this lull, people were at a loss and didn't know what to do next. So students simply hung around the square waiting. One of the most famous Taiwan singers was Ho Jian. Ho moved to the mainland in 1983 in search of his roots. He was the first pop star to appear on national television. Our culture, as well as the political system in mainland China, suppresses the individual and promotes the collective. Collectivism and patriotism are used to make the majority serve the few. I watched the student movement on TV. It was exciting to see so many people demanding democracy. But I was worried by the general intangible nature of their demands. In China, all information is so tightly controlled by the Communist Party that people whose lives are run by this huge machine have no idea how it really works. So they usually behave in one of two ways. They either accept party rule passively or summon the courage to try and smash it all to pieces. But what happens after it's been smashed? Faced with a territory and a population to govern, the student leaders on the square found themselves recreating in miniature all the real-life problems of having and holding power. External threats of government repression meant enforcing internal security. Disagreements with the leadership were labeled betrayal, sabotage, by the familiar small handful of plotters. Struggles between the groups vying for power in the square grew increasingly ugly. As commanders, we tried to make our decision-making process as open as possible. But many students still felt that they had no normal channels through which to express their opinions. When they wanted to be heard, they'd try to seize power. Some student guard units were formed in a bizarre way. Someone from the square would run to the train station to meet newcomers from the provinces. He'd announce, I am the commander of the student security guards. Come with me. The square needs you. So the newcomers, who had no idea what was going on, would become the guy's guard. Then they'd surround the student headquarters or the broadcast station and drive away our guards. Once they took control of the broadcast station, they were in power. Often we had to suppress three or four coups a day. At the time I even joked. Now I finally understand why Li Peng wanted to suppress the students. Once I made a suggestion to the students, that was around May 23rd, I said, why not hold an election at the square or on your campuses? One student, one vote and elect leaders of the student union. But they felt elections were unthinkable in the middle of all that chaos. Then a week later, I heard that the students were setting up a democracy university in the square. I thought, well, that suggestion of mine was at the level of a democracy kindergarten. By the end of May, the students' resources, financial, political, and emotional, were running low, and the square was getting more squalid every day. 
At a meeting on May 27th, Chai Ling and Feng Tsung De reported on the situation in the square. The impression we got was that things were really chaotic. There was endless factional infighting, and sanitary conditions were terrible. We began to doubt whether anything positive could come out of this ongoing stalemate. So we drafted a proposal. The vote in favor of it was unanimous, including Chai Ling. Later we held a press conference in the square to announce this proposal. After the press conference, Li Lu raised objections to our proposal. Then Chai Ling changed her mind and decided to oppose it too. The real issue at the meeting was that some people were trying to use the movement to make themselves famous, and we opposed this. I regret we didn't debate the issue further. Although we had many good arguments in our favor, we felt we couldn't compete with the emotional appeal of their position. So I decided to go back to campus and do what I could to further democracy there. Why did the students want to stay at Tiananmen? Because our goal was to awaken the people. The student population at the square was constantly changing. As those who grew discouraged or disgusted left, they were replaced by enthusiastic newcomers from all over the country. At any one time, there was a majority on the square who would vote to stay. Those who thought it best to leave voted with their feet. That's why I feel so sad, because I can't say all this to my fellow students. I can't tell them straight out that we must use our blood and our lives to call on the people to rise up. Of course the students will be willing, but they are still such young children. Are you going to stay in the square yourself? No, I won't. A television reporter interviewed Chai Ling in one of the new tents on the square. She had changed her mind about leaving. In the past century or so, the Chinese people have shed blood time and again without losing the courage to fight for their ideals. Each battle, however, has ended in a new tragedy, another shattered dream. I believe that what the Chinese lack is not ideals, but the means through which to realize them. Not courage, but the wisdom necessary to achieve their goal. Though they gave the movement no new goals or direction, the bright new tents and supplies from Hong Kong, which included massive infusions of cash, would have lifted anyone's flagging spirits. And how did you raise the money in Hong Kong? Several, many, many ways. For example, there, there, there was one concert, Concert for the Democracy in China. Uh, in that concert alone, 14 million Hong Kong dollars, 14, uh, was raised, okay? And uh, through other channels, Feng Yin, or I mean, many, many channels, through the Federation of Student Union in Hong Kong. International support suggested the possibility of a real victory for the movement. But money did nothing to stop the struggles for power being played out on the square. Uh, the fairly well-known intellectual came to see me. I told him that I had been going to the square every day to persuade all of my students to leave. But he said the students should not leave. He said, with the students at the front lines, we'll be safe. Once the students withdraw, the government will come after the intellectuals. I was furious. 
I said, so you want the students to shield you from danger? The students were in a predicament. They couldn't leave, yet by simply hanging on, the movement was losing its appeal, and the number of people coming to the square was dwindling. On June 2nd, Liao Xiaobo and three of his friends set up a tent on the Martyr's Monument and began their hunger strike. There's no way for me to know whether our hunger strike had affected the government's decision to launch the bloody crackdown. If it did, I would feel guilty for the rest of my life. I never thought our hunger strike would have such an impact. Once again, the square was filled with people. But they hadn't necessarily been attracted by the ideas expressed in our declaration. I think the majority of them came because we had gone on a hunger strike. And especially because the famous rock star, Ho Di Jian, was involved. There was Ho Di Jin wearing his Songs for Democracy t-shirt. He was a real pro in the way he worked the crowd. He'd call out, do you know the singer Deng Li Jun? Yes, came the reply. Then Ho would look for the pop star's signature on his t-shirt. Here she is, she's right here. The crowd went wild. The four hunger strikers were soon infected themselves by the intense emotions on Tiananmen Square, the very thing they wanted to temper. During the movement, I was so often divided. In our hunger strike declaration, I wrote about getting rid of hatred in politics and so on. But when I faced that cheering crowd and felt that we might actually defeat martial law, the voice of reason left me. Once you get involved in the actual situation, it was just so hard to keep a cool head, to know who the hell you are. Facing the thousands of people who cheered me on, I was completely carried away. Now here I was, speaking at Tiananmen Square, I felt that my words could sway the fate of the nation.